this time on the real generation gap. I'm talking about like the division between how to invoke change. Cause in, cause you have uh, MLK Jr. who is about, uh, once again, passive and accommodating. And then you have Malcolm X who is the more extremist, right. more violent means. And it's funny because there was a, a counterpart. Neither one, neither one of them had any results. Neither one of those guys had any results. Today, right in 2024, right now, the, the, the racial situation we have in the country right now, neither one of those guys won that war. Hi, welcome to The Real Generation Gap. I'm BJ Kang. I'm Fred Satilli. And the movie we're reviewing today is Ragtime, the 1981 version, a movie about fame and terrorism in America's 1900s. A black ragtime pianist enters the life of an upper-class white family and sucks them into a conflict of deadly proportions. You're, you made it sound as if there's one story, but you want to talk about the fact that there are multiple stories. I think this movie is about many different plot lines, many different character storylines, but in reality, it's really just about one. Well, it's true. There are multiple interesting characters, but to me, the movie is about one thing and one thing only, and that is one of the seven deadly sins, which is pride. Mm -hmm. Now, the movie opens, and a rich man marries a chorus girl, and then another rich man uses her image to make a statue that, that everybody in New York City is going to see. And he's insulted by this. And so naturally, because this basically really insignificant thing happens, he goes after the guy and shoots him in the head. Yeah. And it's because no one will listen to him. He says, hey, I don't want you using her. She's my wife. She's my wife. He shouldn't have married the chorus girl, but he did. She's my wife. Don't do this. The guy disregards him. He, he can't hear him. He's not listening. Nothing's worse than not being listened to. Then the bubble-headed chorus girl thought she was going to get a million dollars to protect the shooter. They were going to plead insanity. And she thought she was going to get a, She made this deal to get a million dollars to make a sketchy testimony. And she did do that. And then she found out that those rich people weren't going to give her a million dollars. They, they accused her of, you know, malfeasance and they told her, we're going to just give you 25000 in cash and be glad to get it because if it gets, if you don't take it now, you're going to end up with nothing. So she, she runs off with the money. She realizes she can't fight. She's not bright. Yeah. Right. Then a guy falls in love with her and he thinks that he's going to have the beautiful girl. He's not a real good looking guy or anything. He's, he's kind of insignificant in the eyes of society, but... When he doesn't get her love and attention, because she's she's very loose, she's kind of a loose woman, yeah. so she does things with him that he never expected in his life, and he's blown away by this. But to her, it means nothing. But now he thinks she's his, and then when she doesn't show up and she doesn't want him, his pride is hurt, and he becomes a radical. The, the next one is the baby. The rich woman falls in love with the baby. I mean, it's just. One, one pride thing after the other. Everybody's pride. The, uh, the father of the baby, he gets bullied by a white gang. They insult him and they degrade him and embarrass him and everything like that. And so he decides to get revenge. Where if he just let it drop, the, the horrible, the murder of his wife wouldn't have happened. The mother of his child, they weren't, weren't really married. But because he wants to make an issue of this, because he wants to, on principle, he, he wants retribution. And then he, he tells the police officer, you have to do something about this. And the police officer says, look, I, I can't have faced this gang. I got to live in this town. You know, he's a politician like any policeman. And everybody in this movie's got a pride issue. The, the rich father of the rich family, he's like, look, you're, you're making my whole thing look bad here. I, I've, I've made all this wealth and created all this beautiful stuff and you're all soiling it. You know, he could have handled it better. So to me, even though there's racism, even though there's bullying, even though there's ignorance and stupidity, even though all these things are in there, if I was to say one thing the movie was about, it would be that. But there are lots of things, aren't there? Yeah. For me, I thought the movie was a lot about division and sort of comparison. I think I was the one part of the movie that I felt was a little confusing and I felt was the weakest part of the movie was sort of that whole first hour about Evelyn Nesbeth's 
uh, like the the chorus girl Evelyn Nesbitt's life. I was not thrilled or really uh, excited at all about sort of just her, you know, rise to fame and her trying to climb to stardom. Uh, it seemed to me that the real movie began once you were introduced to um, that second act of the of the abandoned child in the garden and then the entrance of uh, of, a, of a mysterious father, uh, Cole House Walker Jr. And that's where the film for me starts off because I think the reason they int- the introduce Evelyn is a sort of juxtaposition between, uh, you know, at the top of society during this time and then sort of uh, the, at the bottom of society here. Right, there's two lower elements, right? Yeah. There's the black people, that's a whole culture. Then there's the poor white people. Now, Evelyn Nesbitt, she was a woman that didn't really have any gifts other than physical beauty, you know, and, and, and the fact that she was easy. She was very comfortable being naked and around people. When attorneys came to talk to her, she was in bed, she was naked. She didn't even attempt to put clothing on. She just talked to them just right out. But the thing that, the thing that tied so many elements of this movie together was in addition to that lower element, there was the Jewish ghetto. Mm-hmm. And there was an artist in the Jewish ghetto, a man who, he, uh, he, he also had pride. His wife, in order to help them survive, was engaged in some kind of small-time prostitution, and that made him go absolutely animal. Yeah. He threw her clothing out the window. When he grabbed his daughter and he went away with the daughter, he threw her out. So now he's a single father. He's got a cute little daughter. But when he wanted to be when he wanted to escalate his career, the star of his show was Evelyn Nesbitt. Yeah. So her her beauty and fame helped vault him in stature. And the fact that he eventually was vaulted into stature by making a movie with her, a silent movie back then, mm-hmm. he caught the eye of the rich man's wife who even though she was the rich man's wife, at the end of the movie ends up running away with him. Mm-hmm. So everybody, this, these cultures, I don't know if it's so much about division, it is about unity. The, the fireworks guy helps the black terrorists. The black terrorists are doing everything totally on principle. They're tired of being an oppressed black minority. They're, yeah. they, they, have, they have angst that's justified. I mean, they're lynching people, right? So back at that time. Mm-hmm. They're, they're justified in what they're doing, but but is terrorism justified? I think that was something that was definitely, that was one of the tones or themes that was sort of uh, honed in on. This, I thought this, was, this movie was very much about racial oppression and the uh, sort of differences in approaches towards breaking oppression. And I thought that was really emphasized in that scene where Booker T. Washington walks in to the library that they have hostage to talk with the extremists, specifically Cole House, about, um, you, you know, you're making us look bad. It's like they're never going to, you know, give us a chance and they're never going to see us anything as sav- besides being savages if you don't stop this right now. And he says they see us as savages regardless. It's like if we don't make a stand uh, now, then they're never going to take us seriously. They're never going to listen to us. Exactly. And what did I say at the very beginning of this? It's about being listened to. Right, the the Jewish artist wanted to be recognized. He had a real talent, but nobody was listening to him. Nobody was entertaining him. The son of the rich man who wanted the affection of Evelyn Nesbitt, no one was listening to him. He had a lot to offer a woman, but because he was just a plain guy, he couldn't get the attention of a woman. So many people wanted attention. They wanted to be heard and listened to. Call House Walker, he was like, look, I was attacked by the gang of white thugs. They didn't beat him up or anything. They just, they just, they roughed him up a little bit. They, they didn't like the fact that he had a fancy car, so they vandalized the car a little bit. And he could have just taken it and left. Mm-hmm. But he wanted to stand on principle. Well, standing on principle cost him his life. They, they, his, his poor, the mother of his child was murdered in a, a horrible way. That left his baby son with no father or mother because he was on the run. Mm-hmm. Now the rich white family is caring for the black baby. The father of the rich 
he doesn't want that. He doesn't want chaos. He created a life of tranquility in his world. With his wealth, he created a tranquil life. He married the most beautiful woman ever, the Mary Steenburgen. and oh my God. And what did she do? She wants to adopt the black child in 1900, right? In what, 1903 or 1902? I was like around that time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he's like, yeah, just give the baby to the orphan home. Like, this isn't part of my program, and this is, I'm the man, this is my house, this is my wealth, I've invited you to enjoy my wealth, and what do you do? You're bringing this random element of chaos into my life. If I have this baby in my home, the entire neighborhood is going to talk about this the rest of my life. This is not something I wanted in my life. I'm not inviting this in, but you are. You are. You're doing this to me without any consideration. She doesn't discuss it with him. I think like that's that element of pride you're talking about. That pride of like this is the, like uh, this is not our problem, and this the more that we let this affect us, the more that the, it makes us look bad. But no, I no, I, no not ba not bad. It doesn't make them look bad. It's just see what happens is this: if you do if you do something that's out of the ordinary, you're going to be identified as that thing. So say you wear a giant yellow hat everywhere you go. Yeah. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, but people will identify you as the giant yellow hat guy. It'll be, there he is, the giant yellow hat guy, the giant yellow hat guy. So now this guy is going to be, rather than all the accomplishments that he did in business, he had an explosives business, right? He had the fireworks. fireworks did, yeah, yeah, he fireworks could, yeah. Business, yeah. So rather than be identified as that, it will be, there's the guy who adopted the black baby. There's the guy who adopted the black baby. There's the guy who, that was going to be his identity from that point on. Like it or not. I mean, that's and that sounds like why he was trying to, you know, get them out of his house. I agree yeah. that, you know, it's an element of chaos, but I think that I have a more sympathetic view towards the mother because I think she was more sympathetic of uh, of those people, of uh, Sarah and uh, Cole House and their whole situation. And I think part of the reason why she probably left um, the father at the end of the movie was because the uh, the uh, the Jewish filmmaker was also sympathetic towards their view. And I think she was, you know, leaving a, a man who was callous towards these sort of issues at this time uh, for someone who was more sympathetic. But he had already made a name for himself. Yeah. So, no, I, I, I don't think that things should be imposed on people. You know, imposed how it's, it's well, it, it's just like an Atlas shrugged. Okay. Okay. The, the guy who's the steel magnate, he has a mother and he has a brother and the mother loves both of her sons. The one son is a ne'er-do-well. The other one is a steel magnate. The steel magnate has to provide a home for his mother because he should, he can. And he also has to provide a home for his brother. Now his brother is organizing the union strike against the steel mill. So he's living in this man's home that he made because he's an incredible metallurgist who invented this new kind of steel, mm -hmm. right? But he's got to put up with the crap that his brother brings. And he has to let the brother do it because his mother wants this to happen. There's entirely too much of this kind of stuff in the world. Mm -hmm. There's entirely too much compromise. It seems that the poor have to compromise because they're poor. In the meantime, the people at the top have to compromise because they have to put up with all the chaos that all these people's lives bring them. It's a very unfair world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And E.L. Doctorow, a fantastic writer, he puts so many elements into this story. This story is so complex. I mean, part of the complexity, the rich man tells the ignorant, poor black girl who's got the baby and is trying to raise her. She actually left the baby in the garden. She abandoned the baby because she knew she couldn't take care of it. So the mother gives her the hope. We're going to take you. We're going to bring the baby in. We're going to bring you in, right? Yeah. It's really not how it should have went. But the rich father, he says to the girl, look, this is your baby. This is not my baby. This guy, Cole House Walker, is the man, the father of your baby. You have to do something here. You have to bring some kind of attention to this or whatever. And she makes an attempt to 
reach a politician who's got a wall of bodyguards in front of him. She wants to be heard. This is President Roosevelt, I believe, at the time. The VP. Yeah. 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 She wants to be heard. And she really doesn't have the capacity to do this. But this, the rich guy tells her, "You, it, this is on you. You have to do this. So she hears that and she accepts it. I have to do this. She, she goes and she attempts to find this guy and the bodyguards beat her up and to the point where she dies from the injuries. The callous father, he's really responsible for her death. He sent her off to this. Yeah. Right, but her ignorance is responsible for her death. The guys who beat her are responsible for her death in an immediate and physical and material way. And all she wanted to do was be heard. All she wanted to do was tell this guy, "You have to help my baby daddy. He's being unjustly treated, yeah. or whatever." And she's what this man demands of her to do is so far from her capacity. It's terrible. It's terrible. This story I, is a masterpiece. I want everybody to watch this movie. Everybody, this is so thought-provoking. I mean, you you out there, you're hearing us talk about this now, but believe me, we talked about this for an hour before this. Uh, all, all these aspects, all these things that they showed in this movie, I mean, just the fact that they showed Houdini yeah. being lifted by a crane and getting out of the straitjacket. I mean, the things that people were doing for attention, that was his celebrity, the young girl was taking her clothes off all the time. That was her a, a just attempt to elevate herself out of, you know, out of obscurity. Yeah. The movie's amazing. E.L. Doctorow, I, I, I just, I can't even tell you how impressed I am I, with I the I definitely book. like that part where they showed Roosevelt and Houdini because it really uh, cements, it's like these tiny little vignettes or to, sort of, of these little moments in this time of history to really cement that this is, this is the early 1900s. This is, uh, you know, this is that time in American history. And I, this was a movie made in 1981. Uh, Escape, yeah. Escape from New York uh, came out this year. Raiders of the Lost Ark came out this year. Right. And I, Mad I, Max. I, right. Mad Max yeah. 2 yeah. came out. And I was, uh, I, I was, it, it was hard for me to believe that this was not being filmed during that time. The set, you know, the set design, the costumes, uh, there was little details that I really loved, like, the uh the they knew that that car that uh cole house was driving was called the model t which was like the new car just made by oh, ford yeah. i believe right and then <laughs> yes it was ford yeah. yeah and then the the car and then the rifles that the police were using with those very long scopes at the end those uh 1903 spring wa- springfield rifles right that was uh, a great. real world war one yeah yeah right there is that thin little sort of uh almost telescope uh and, and, and look who they picked for the policeman, James Cagney, Jimmy Cagney, yeah. from another era. It's almost like right? uh, this movie has sort of three protagonists. The first one starts off with Evelyn. This, uh, and then the second act, it's Cole House Walker Jr. He, he's almost the protagonist from that point on. But then it, be, it sort of becomes more about... And then Cagney takes a large, uh, larger role as the police commissioner during this time. And each part is sort of like a different part. It's like Evelyn's part... Uh, while I, I still consider the weakest part of the film is about, you know, fame and stardom and all of that. While on the flip side, Cole House's part, the second act, is all about, you know, pride, struggle, and frustration under oppression. And then uh, the police commissioner's part in the third act is all about sort of like sort of bureaucracy and also like uh, kind of it turns almost into a police drama right there at the end. The, so, the whole hostage right. it, yeah, interrogation. That part was really cool to me. This was a real transitional time in America. And the filmmakers who made this, once again, like you said, the costume designers, the set designers, and this is a film with no special effects. I mean, everything is... I want to go back to talking about what I thought the main, what I thought the movie was mainly about. To me, this movie was mainly about racial oppression. It was about division and stuff like that. I think... Uh, and we argued a little bit about this before we started putting uh, we started we turned on the cameras we started filming about that you said you were you had a problem with the word uh, oppression or racial oppression can you go into that a little bit yeah it was that was not really part of the movie i would i would definitely i would say that that was the main point of the movie or it was one of the main themes of the no, entire film no it was more about poverty and ignorance and primarily about pride 
All the problems in this movie were the result of pride. I think that there's a juxtaposition, though. Like, there's a, you have the pride of even say, the bullies were proud. Yes, right. The Irish fireman, the volunteer Irish fireman, the, that guy, he was like, he thought he was a big shot. He was like, you're going to let not let these black people get the better of me. Well, they were better than him, weren't they? Yeah. But he had this weird false pride, also. I think if I think there is a theme of pride. You have the pride of the rich. Uh, husband that she has evelyn has at the beginning and he says uh, in the courthouse he, uh, he ruined my wife he ruined my life and that, oh, that was that his wasn't pride. that wasn't the rich father the that was the rich husband that she had the evelyn Nesbitt right nesba's husband right yeah, yeah. at yeah. the very beginning where the one he shoots uh mr white i believe he's called right yeah yeah so you have that pride but then i think that there's a difference between that pride sort of the one about just like the way that you look and the way it affects you versus the pride that Cole House has where it's all about being just treated as like an equal individual. I have pride as a human being and I think that's right to stand up for. That's why he's arguing with the police officer that it's not about just cleaning it up. It's about the principle of it and is it is that they've singled me out because of just like of my skin color. That that's racial prejudice, not racial suppression. Well, it also comes from the fact that he was he went to go report it to the police and then they told him to go to the city clerk and then they tell him to go back to police. Well, and that's a bureaucracy runaround. We're all victims of that every day. At least I'm a victim of it all the time. And everyone yeah. is apathetic to his struggle. No one would listen. Right. Yes. Yeah. He wanted to be listened to. That's what he wanted was to be listened to. And they even said it in the movie. One of the one of the uh, policemen or whatever, he said, I think this guy just wants to tell his story. In fact, it was the rich white guy, the rich father. Right? Mary Steenburgen's husband. Yeah. He said, I think this guy just wants to be heard. And that really was what he wanted. He just wanted the world to know that bullies took advantage of him, you know, for his race and for his, he was a peacock. He shouldn't have been. That was wrong. I don't, see, that's another part that I, that I have a, a problem with is that, is that, you know, alongside him was another rich industrialist, the, uh, the CEO of a fireworks company and the Irish firemen certainly didn't have any problem with him. They only had a problem with the black man driving. Well, that's in the story. Car. Yeah. That's in the story. Now you're, you're talking about, you're, there, there's something that I want to bring up. And do you, do you know what a, a, a cost return analysis is? Uh, loosely. Okay. So if you're going to do something, what's it going to cost and what's going to be the return? So here's a guy who he got stopped on the street. They teased him and they soiled his car. And if he knew that the cost of his actions were going to result in all these terrible things, would he have done them? I think the real question that sort of, you know, narrows in on the focus of this movie is why is it that he driving past the fire station or just driving through his town is a cost to begin with? He's a victim of bullies. It would be wonderful if the world was full of things that were fair. What happened to him was not fair. But when something happens to you that's not fair, do you sacrifice your whole family to bring it to, the, uh, to a head? You got to say, okay, something happened to me. It wasn't fair. I, I, can, I can fight it and, and lose everything. Or... I can just ignore it and have a productive and happy life from this point. And he had a productive and happy life. I think that was one of like the points of his character, though, that he was pointing out, was that everyone's telling him just let it go and just it's just not a big deal. But he goes, well, why shouldn't it be? Like, why isn't it a big deal? It's like no, these no, guys. No, it, it is a big deal, but you have to do the you have to do the cost return analysis. It is a big deal. What happened to him was wrong. It was we all agree that should have never happened. The white firemen were totally wrong. Everybody, the ones that supported the bully were wrong. I mean, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't terrible. He made it really terrible. It was wrong, but it was a small little thing. It was a schoolyard incident, really. He was wronged. He was, he was, his principles were right. But when you start to get that kind of pushback, he finds the police officers, those guys assaulted me. And he says, yeah, well, that's, you know, your best bet is to just let it go. That was perfect advice. That was his best bet because look at all the horrible things that happened as a result of his pride. I don't think, I don't think that, I think the point of the movie is, is that his actions should not have 
you know required a cost because it, the, in, the in, proper- a, in a fair world once again you're you're young you're idealistic life is not like that you know he had to confront booker t washington right booker t washington came in when he was holding the museum hostage and he said i am trying to effect change through peaceful resistance through you know he was like gandhi mm-hmm. right he said we're gonna we're gonna show these white people that we're good valuable god loving people and all that kind of thing and over a course of time they'll come to be feel not threatened by us and they'll accept us and our our existence in what was originally their world will will be completely normalized and everything will be nice and that was the way booker t washington wanted it to go but this guy didn't want it to go that way and he he wasn't wrong booker t washington wasn't necessarily right but he was he was a voice of reason, but he was disregarded. The guy laughed at him. He said, "Well, you know, you'll always just be, you know, a second class citizen as long as you don't stand up for yourself or whatever." So, it's you really have to in every situation, you have to do the the cost return analysis. You mm-hmm. is what I'm doing, you know, what is the cost going to be? What is the return going to be? And in this case, the final end of the story was. These black savages attack this museum full of antiques. No, nothing, nothing was. He didn't win the battle at the end. And at the end, you know, he, at the end, everybody just went along, and it was easy to do because of Randy Newman's incredible musical score. And and uh, not not to divert right at this moment, but didn't that add a like a weird like a sardonic. The fact that there was this ragtime music playing throughout the thing, man, it made it seem even more unreal than ever. I, see, I mean, I thought the ragtime music was very precise, as I would say. I think it was one of the most precise soundtracks I have ever heard, in my opinion. I thought it was very, uh, it, it perfectly encapsulated, I think, the movie. It was like a kind of a cherry on top. It really was. And it, it really made the, it really took you. It was one more thing that took you to another level of the time. Yeah. Like you and I are not from then. We can never imagine what it was like to be from then. Yeah. These streets were unpaved. They didn't have cars yet. It was all dirt roads. Well, there was one car in the movie. Yeah. Well, th- that's when they invented it. Yeah. You know? And so, and, and, even though that, even though the Model T was an everyman car, if, if if he if he didn't buy that car, none of those things would have happened. Yeah, but those is, people were offended. He offended the bullies that he gave them a reason to pick up. Oh, you want to show off? You're coming through the town. You're better than me. You're whatever it may be. I'm not having that. Well, I think that was one of the main points of the movie right there was that he was doing what any other rich, you know, white man would have done. He at wasn't the time. A, he wasn't rich. He was just a piano player. He had a good amount of money to yeah, buy. Yeah, he had the enough Model to T. do that and to buy nice that clothes. That was one of the facts. He didn't support his wife and child. He didn't get him a home. Well, he said because at the time he didn't have the, the money. The first and thing once he did he has the money. The, uh, yeah, the first thing he did was he he did the peacocking. He, he flashy clothes, flashy car, right? Meanwhile, he the woman of his child and his child were living in somebody else's house, and he, you know, he wanted to marry the woman and everything, but he didn't do the first thing, get them a place to live. The first thing he did was doll himself up, and it was not good, and it didn't work out well. And to do that in that era, right now, it's hard for you to even imagine the level, the level of of um, ostentatia that he decided to exhibit. Not everybody had a car, but he did, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, keep a little bit lower profile until you have a little bit more security. That was one of, that was, uh, I think that was really telling about Booker T. Washington and Cole House's confrontation, was Booker T. Washington was famous at the time for being accommodating to the society at the time, and then as time goes by, then they would begin to accept, be accepted. But uh, Cole House was like, well, why should I be accommodating? It's like, if I'm equal Because to you don't else- have the power to defend yourself, Mr. Walker. You don't have the power to defend yourself. You can't go up against this gigantic juggernaut. You don't have the muscle for it. And then the moment he begins to show the muscle, all of a sudden it's a problem. Well, yeah. Nothing gets attention like terrorism. Yeah. You want to hold something or somebody hostage, you're going to have attention 
for a short amount of time and then you're going to be dealt with and he was dealt with and i thought and i thought it was interesting that they had this juxtaposition once again between two different styles of how to invoke change because you have booker t washington who's more passive and accommodating and then you have cole and he was all dressed up too wasn't he yes and you have cole house who is the extremist someone who is willing to have a more violent means of change which sort of echoes the way i would say it uh it it for it would foretell the common diverging views of civil rights for african americans in the near future because then you later have for every for every people every society it's you know right now we have tremendous division in this country people like to scream about racism but we have a division of poverty that's off the chain i'm talking about like the division between how to invoke change because then because you have uh mlk jr who is about uh once again passive and accommodating and then you have malcolm x who is the more extremist right. more violent means and yeah. it's funny because there was a, a counter neither one neither one of them had any results neither one of those guys had any results today right in 2024 right now the, the, the racial situation we have in the country right now, neither one of those guys won that war. It didn't happen. It's worse now than it was then. I don't think so because they had Jim Crow laws back then and we don't now, so it seems a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, we have abortion killing half the black population before they're born. Yeah, it's not, it's not good. It's not, it's not good now. Those guys didn't win. They didn't, they didn't affect society in such a way that this condition doesn't exist. At that time, I think that there was less angst over race than there is now. And I lived then. I was there for the Newark riots. I was there when Martin Luther King was killed. I remember this. Believe me, it's not better now. It's not better at all now. So the terrorism didn't work. The Black Panthers, that didn't work, right? Martin Luther King's... You know, I have a dream that one day, the, you know, that thing, that didn't work. We still have unbelievable division now, and maybe worse than then. It's really a shame. It doesn't say much for the human race, does it? I'll give you an example. Is it is it better or worse? Okay, we had World War II. Okay, Hitler wanted to exterminate the Jews. Yes. They they created the country of Israel shortly after the war. The British mandate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is there less Jew hatred now than there was then? Right now we have Harvard students screaming their head off to the, you know, death of the Israelites and everything, whatever it may be. The Jews are reviled like worldwide after all this time, after Hitler, the concentration camps, the creation of the Jewish state and all this. We're not doing better. We suck. It's just terrible. Racial problems? We we have them. That was 1902. It's 120 years later. It's still a big stigma, right? Yeah. And and God knows who else and what else. You remember when you're you're of Asian descent? You just a few years ago they had a thing where black people were just going out indiscriminately beating up Asian people. Yeah. You remember it? Yeah, I do. That was in your lifetime. I'm not happy about that. That was, and, and why? And why were they bullying them? Because the Asian people were successful and peaceful. And because they weren't successful and peaceful, they resented that. So you start walking, it's happening again now. Now, the, the, the thing, the sport now of just walking down the street and punching somebody right in the face for no reason is happening today in America. I just want to highlight as well, Howard Rollins was nominated for best supporting actor for this film, and after seeing this movie, I really thought he should have won it. I, I think. <laughs> well, he did. He was, you know, he he was. He didn't win the. Uh, the well, the, just to be nominated is yeah. gigantic. At least he's I think recognized. He should have won the actual whole award, though. Well, who did win the award? I I did not look into it. Okay. I I definitely think I definitely think that uh, Howard Rollins should have won best supporting actor for this. He played an electrifying role, and I would say electrifying from beginning to end. Yes, as yeah. a you know very much just man tr- who's completely driven to the end of his uh the end of his wit and is completely frustrated with the way that the system has treated him and stuff like that mm-hmm. and he did and and the, the scene that i loved more than anything was when he came to the rich people's home they allowed him to come in he said well i i play the piano and father said i i 
I don't think he can read music. And he's like, put it up, put it up. And then he played so beautifully. Yeah. You know, and he did it and the looks on his face, right? And when he auditioned for the saloon where he was going to play, like his whole body was a showman. Like he's like winking at the audience and posturing and doing. He's a real peacock. That's the only word I can think of to describe him. Mm -hmm. He's just a great big. He was the James Brown of 1902. My favorite scenes were uh, all of this sort of uh, interrogate negotiation sort of debates that he has at the very end. You have Booker T. Washington who comes in to argue about what's the right way to uh, invoke change, to invoke progress for our people. And then you have the father who comes in and says, why are you doing this? There's no, you know, yeah, it's, it's not just, pragmatic. Le legally, you could just get out of this. And it's like, they're all talking with this man who has nothing to lose. And the last thing he wants to do is just, you know, make a difference in some way get people talking and that's what he says to uh his you know gang uh at the very end is like it has to be more than just five of us dead uh you guys have to get out in order for there to actually be some change here oh so you're going with the sequel that the guys who got out are going to come back later and you know it's going to be escape from new york too or something like that or <laughs> not that but just that like <laughs> Th those are my favorite scenes because he really comes into this as a sort of a, as, as a leader, as a revolutionary. It's interesting. He goes from a man who just wants to have a family and then the way that society, you know, sort of screws him over, forces well, they, him to well, become they, this. Well, they, they, you know, they're the fly in his Chardonnay, right? He's finally got some success and he wants to really enjoy that success, but it's inappropriate. It's premature. It's too soon to, and it's not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So he wants to do things his way, and that's not the way of the world. I thought that's what the movie was about. Like, I thought he was very much the main character of this film. I felt it was very weird for Evelyn Nesbitt to have such a big part. Maybe at most, you know, her problems are all about fame and, you know, success, but his problems are about so much more than that. And something that I thought was interesting was that the, the poster's tagline for the film was, uh, young, beautiful, passionate, and scandalous. She was America in the time of ragtime, and I thought, yeah. well, nah. that's, I was like, that's nah. very. I thought that was <laughs> that's misleading because the film's not really about her. And then, and then I found out that the Paramount Pictures had actually printed a second poster with a second tagline to appeal specifically to black audiences, and it reads like this: it "says A black man said, respect me or kill me.' They took away Cole House's wife, child, and pride. He made them pay in a way America will never forget. It was a tough time. It was ragtime. I thought that this was the tagline that should have been for the movie because I think that's what the movie was really about. I think that's a very pandering tagline. Give me liberty or give me death, right? That's yeah, the, yeah. Give, well, is is that realistic? Is that what everybody should be doing? because half of us will be dead, right? Because everybody's put upon, right? There's, the life is not fair to most people. Yeah, but some people certainly are willing to die for a more yeah, fair Yeah, well, they life. can, but unfortunately, they drag a whole bunch of other people in with them, yeah. including his own family and his own ch children. I think this movie is a gigantic tribute to the E.L. Doctorow, who wrote the book. He had a really lot to say, and he said it all. Like I didn't really expect to like this movie, if I was being honest. And I found I was very uh, I was very pleasantly surprised about how much I actually enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was amazing as a historical film. It was kind of like uh, American Graffiti. It really captured <laughs> it really captured what it was like to live at that time. It was like sort of a perfect picture still of you know what was going on in america at that time and what it looked like what it sounded like and probably what it smelled like as well yeah period pieces are amazing yeah i thought it was a very successful period piece and i i thought i was surprised to find out that it was much more nuanced and poignant than you know right than i was led on to you have to trust the old professor i'm not bringing <laughs> you junk here uh, I don't think there needs to be a whole hour dedicated to a character who's not really the best part of the film, uh, Evelyn Nesbitt specifically in this part, but I think everything that comes after that, all of Cole House's story, was, uh, honestly, I was on the edge of my seat, really. Uh, uh, from that point on, I was captivated entirely throughout, and so I would give it a 7 out of 10. Honestly, I, it would go to an 8 or a 9 if it did a little bit less with Evelyn Nesbitt. <laughs> Well, for me, it's a 10. I think it's a film that's definitely still uh, relevant today as it was back then, especially in the context of the way things are going socially and you know, politically here in the United States, especially as this is a part of American history.
Right. Thank you for watching The Real Generation Gap. And before you comment, we invite you to watch the movie and decide for yourself. Was this a movie about racial oppression or something broader like, you know, human nature and pride? Thank you for watching.